Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books, and sometimes remember to press record before I start doing this. So this video um, is going to be the first of two um, on the prologue of Guy Gabriel Kay's to Ghana. And the reason I want to do two is the opening of the prologue, the, the first sort of part of it, is very much about how Kay sets the scene and I can talk about a lot of his language and the techniques. And then the second video is much more about how he builds theme um, that's going to be explored in the novel and some of the stuff that he does with dialogue. So I thought I just I split it out into these two different things because it it is quite, it's a really juicy, meaty, there's lots of stuff to talk about here kind of prologue. And I didn't want to be sitting here for an hour and a half. So let's start with how K opens to Ghana. Both moons were high, dimming the light of all but the brightest stars. The campfires burned on either side of the river, stretching away into the night. Quietly flowing, the Daisa caught the moonlight and the orange of the nearer fires and cast them back in wavery, sinuous ripples. And all the lines of light led to his eyes, to where he was sitting on the riverbank, hands about his knees, thinking about dying and the life he'd live. And I think this is a beautiful opening to the novel. And the, the first thing to note is the opening two words, the very first two words are the things that tell you this is a fantasy novel. Both moons. There's more than one moon. Opening two words, fantasy novel, done. Like, it, it's great when something like that happens so quickly, so simply, and without grand fanfare or using strange or startling or weird fantasy terms. Both moons, we immediately know we're in a fantasy novel. Both moons were high, dimming the light. And this is I've spoken about this before. This is this wonderful technique of using contrasting language uh, or contradictory language to emphasize um, and create a more poetic vision and depth to what you're talking about. So both moons were high. So we get this emphasis on big moons, bright moons. That's what's being created by both moons were high. Even though it's only talking about their position in the sky, we're getting a sense of light from them. Dimming the light. And of course, dimming, darkness, light, brightness. We get this wonderful contrast, dimming the light of all but the brightest stars. So again, high light uh, and brightest, all emphasizing this brightness, but dimming is there in the middle of it to give it that contrast and that texture to the sentence to make the sentence richer. So on the one hand, very literal, you know when there's a, uh, we, we talk about light pollution from cities that make it very difficult to see the stars. But on those nights when there's a new moon and uh, therefore the moon is very dark, but there are no clouds in the sky, you can see a lot of stars. When there is a full moon, because the moon then appears so bright, we can't see as many stars. That's the literal thing that's happening here. But the poetic thing is just so much nicer. It's a, a nicer way to describe it. So the campfires burned on either side of the river, stretching away into the night. So the first sentence introduced that it was nighttime, and the second half of the second sentence confirms that. So again, we have this thing where something is suggested in one sentence and is confirmed later. And that's a, it's a nice technique that consolidates knowledge as you go along. The campfires burned on either side of the river. So another thing to note, we started out talking about light in the, the moons and the stars. So we've moved now from the celestial, from the heavens, down to the terrestrial, the mundane, campfires. So these giant, brilliant orbs in the sky to something very, very localized from what we assume are the, the, clean, uh, the clean light of the moon down to that ruddy, burning, um, much more textured light from campfires burned on either side of the river. So we have, again, another nice contrast between fire and water because it's on either side of the river, there are these fires. So we get this 
elemental contrast worked into the sentence. And river is a threshold, is a dividing line, is a border that is marking out that, yes, there may be campfires on both sides, so there's some similarity to both sides, but there are two sides to this, not one. Quietly flowing, the Dysa caught the moonlight and the orange of the nearest fires and cast them back in wavery, sinuous ripples. Where we were told that there was a river, so on either side of the river, now we know the river's name. The Dysa caught the moonlight. So quietly flowing is the, the two words there, quietly flowing, the Dysa. So we know that this proper noun, uh, D-E-I-S-A, Dysa, uh, is the name of the river without K having to tell us that is the name of the river. We just know. We also know that it is quietly flowing. So it's not stagnant. We get a sense of the sort of the babbling brook, but it is emphasizing the quietness, the stillness of this nighttime scene, that this is not raucous. It's not loud. It's quiet. It's contemplative. It is a beautiful still night. The dice caught the moonlight and the orange of the nearer fires and cast them back in wavery, sinuous ripples. So the light now is being cast back in a mode and, and form that is similar to the water. So we get water and light and fire all sort of blending together into one sort of image. But it is wavery. It is sinuous. These are delicate. They are not strong, sharp images. This is all about delicate and soft, and all the lines of light led to his eyes. So to even just listen to that sentence, or that part of the sentence, and all the lines of light led to his eyes, that there's a, a, a pattern to it, the stressed and unstressed syllables, that this is very lyrical and poetic in its structure. And we have the alliteration that is forcing us to, to see that all lines light led, which draws our eye, draws our attention, but it also forces that rhythm into how we read it. And we now know that this scene, this vista, this setting is all being experienced from a single point of view character because all of these lines of light are going to one point. And the point is this one character's eyes so this is our perspective. This is how we are seeing the scene. To where he was sitting on the riverbank. So someone is sitting on the riverbank. They are seeing all of this. They are our point of view character. They are male. Hands about his knees, thinking about dying and the life he'd live. So if you think someone is sitting with their hands about their knees, they are not quite a fetal position, which is generally on your side, but that sort of curled up. Either they're very, very cold or this is a, um, they're stressed and worried. This is a protective, worried, um, stressed position that you curl up to protect yourself. And that's how he's sitting there all bunched up. And he's thinking about dying and the life he'd live. So this is contemplative. This is someone sitting there in the darkness, in the stillness, looking at the night sky, listening to the sound of the river, thinking about dying and the life they'd live. So evaluating their life. Very contemplative scene, um, internal. There was a glory to the night, Savar thought, breathing deeply of the mild summer air, smelling water and water flowers and grass, watching the reflection of blue moonlight and silver on the river, hearing the dice's murmurous flow at the distant singing from around the fire. And if we look, we've, we've gone from in the first paragraph, um, a short sentence, a sentence that's slightly longer, a sentence that gets even longer, a sentence that gets even longer, and now we get into an incredibly long sentence, that each of these sentences is building and getting bigger. And, you know, we are frequently told when, when we're learning to write, you don't have sentence fragments, don't have run on sentences. Don't just stick everything together. Take separate sentences to make things concise, to make things clear. But here, this is someone thinking about dying in the life they'd lived. This is clearly 
what he is, what's running around in his head. And so we have a river winding their, its way through this scene. And now we have a river of words winding its way through the point of view character's mind. And so without going into direct uh, envisioning of the exact thoughts that he's having, and then signaling that with italics, what we have here is the structure of the sentence showing us as reader that this is really what he is thinking. And Kay even adds the words Savar thought, uh, just so, you know, we don't miss it. But there was glory to the night. And you, you think about how we did, oh, last night, it, the sky was glorious. It was a glorious sunset. But this idea of the sublime, this beautiful night sky. But what's interesting, interesting is that we know in this prologue that it's going to start referring to war. And here, glory is a word that frequently gets used in fantasy for war, the glorification of war. And so Kay is using it in this sense about the glory of night, the glory of nature, the, this beautiful, beautiful, wonderful sight. And that word is prefiguring the discussion about war that's going to happen and how it contrasts with what Savar thinks is glorious, that war is not glorious. But breathing deeply of the mild summer air. So when we think about the hands about his knees, we thought he could have been cold. But now we're given the information that mild summer air, it's not cold. He's not cold. Therefore, this thinking about dying and thinking about his life, that's why he's curled up and thinking he's, he's in that position, not because he's cold. So it confirms to us the intentionality of what the character's actions are and what the character is feeling without having to spell it out. Smelling water and water flowers grass. Now we all know water doesn't really have a smell, but a little river running by where it's the splashing of the water against the rocks and that sort of petrichor smell, that is that sort of nice, natural, fresh smell. And the flowers and the grass, these are all clean smells, relaxing smells. And again, it's mild summer air. So even though it's nighttime, we're getting a sense of that gentle warmth. Everything is gentle. The wavery, sinuous ripples. This is all gentle language. Watching the reflection of blue moonlight and silver. So we get a suggestion that one of the moons is blue and one is silver, which is again, you know, emphasizing very subtly that this is a fantasy world. But again, it's this nice cool imagery and the reflection. So again, all about the visual, which is contrasting with because we had the first paragraph, almost all visual. Then we had the mild summer air, which is tactile because it's about temperature. And then the scent, the smell of water, water flowers and grass. So working in these additional senses into the description so that we can place it more clearly in our minds. And now moving back on to the reflection of blue moonlight and silver playing across the river. Because again, that's um, that's a sense of, because we know the river is in motion, we, and we know that these are wavery, sinuous ripples, it's a sense of gentle motion and the play of light. And then we have added in hearing the dice's murmurous flow and the distant singing from around the fires. So now we have an actual sound coming in. And it's this murmurous flow, this gentle sound of the river that is lulling him, that is quiet and the distant singing from around the fires. So again, it's not loud, it's not raucous, it's, it's being out and hearing those noises drift towards you from the distance, where you can hear them, and it's, but it's far away and they, they seem strange. There was singing on the other side of the river too, he noted, listening to the enemy soldiers north of them. So here we have confirmation that there are enemy soldiers to the north of them. There's distant singing from the fires behind him. That both these sides are singing. They both have campfires. They're both on either side of the river. So there is a suggestion without saying it that where there's enemy soldiers on one side, he's on the other side with his soldiers. That's the implication in the subtext. 
and both sides, even though they're opposing, they're on opposite sides, they're both singing. So even though they're the enemy, even though they're soldiers, that there's a point of connection between the two. That yes, they're on opposite sides, but they are in some way the same. They're both sides are singing. It was curiously hard to impute any absolute sense of evil to those harmonizing voices or to hit them quite as blindly as being a soldier seemed to require. So here we have a statement and a thought from Savar, which I think gives us a little insight into how he perceives the world. That yes, this is the enemy on the other side of the river. Yes, they are soldiers, but they're not absolutely evil because they have created something beautiful, harmonizing voices. These harmonizing voices in song, it is a creation of beauty. Something that creates beauty cannot be all evil. And so Savar is making a judgment based on if you can create beauty, if you can create art, you aren't all evil. So he's equating beauty and creation with good, which is an interesting sort of character judgment. And um, he also says, or, or thinks, or to hit them quite as blindly as being a soldier seemed to require. So here we have Savar is not sure what being a soldier is, but he knows what it kind of should be because it seems to require hitting people. So he doesn't quite understand it, which again gives you the suggestion that he's not actually a soldier. And of course, this is what I said earlier that Kay gives us a lot of these implications, but now we have the confirmation. He wasn't really a soldier though, and he had never been good at hating. So looking at this, we now know he isn't actually a soldier, but he's presumably there as a soldier, that he's never been good at hating. So conversely, we think that if he ascribes hate to destruction and good to creation, if he's never been good at hating, he's probably good at, or he thinks that he's good at the other thing, which means he's probably good at creating something. He couldn't actually see any figures moving in the grass across the river, but he could see the fires and it wasn't hard to judge how many more of them lay north of the Daisa than there were behind him, where his people waited for the dawn. So what we have here is this wonderful evocation of what we see in fantasy and historical fiction and in historical records all the time. When they're counting the enemy numbers at night, you don't try and count the individual soldiers because you can't see them. So you count the campfires and then make a rough calculation based by the number of people who'd be around the campfire. Straightforward, we've seen it a million times. And yet here it's reflected and recounted to us in a way that is unusual because he couldn't see the figures moving in the grass the river but he could see the fires and he's not judging it in terms of i'm counting the men to find out their forces it's more this sort of perception of what is there all about this vision and this light and he knows there's many more of them on the enemy side than there is on his side and so when he says where his people waited for the dawn we usually think of dawn as optimistic, the start of a new day, the new beginning, the dawn, light coming. Uh, it is when Gandalf writes down, look for me, uh, look for me at the dawn or look for me, whatever, you know, and the light coming up or that sort of thing. Light is associated with good, dawn is associated with a new beginning. But here there's an implication that the dawn is actually an ending, that this is the inverse of what we typically expect. And so where night, where when the sun sets is usually the ending. Here we're getting a sense that when the sun rises, that is an ending. And again, Kay confirms it in the next line. Almost certainly their last. So where his people waited for the dawn, almost certainly their last. He had no illusions. None of them did. Not since the battle at the same river five days ago. And again, I think this is really clever and fascinating use of language. He had no illusions, none of them did. Illusions typically being vision-based, 
he can see clearly he uh, has this great vision we've seen all of this visual language being used so he he had no illusions not since the battle at the same river five days ago and that implies at a battle five days ago at this same river they had illusions they thought that they could win because now we know the coming of the dawn is going to be their last they no longer have any illusions they are dying so this gives us the suggestion that five days ago they had mustered this army they had ridden out to face these people and they had won or at least defeated them and, and made them retreat slightly. And they thought that they could win. But following that battle, and in the subsequent time, all of their illusions have been stripped away that they realize now, no, they cannot win. And so he is sitting here on his own at night by this river, hugging his own knees, thinking about all of his life, thinking about his death because he knows in the morning he's going to die because there's going to be a battle and they're going to lose and that is all set up in the language and none of it is being directly told to us all they had was courage and a leader whose defiant gallantry was almost matched by the two young sons who were here with him so they they have gumption that's all they've got going for them. Gumption and a great leader, this defiant gallantry. He's this wonderful noble. He's the, um, the bright knight leading them, who has two young sons who are there with him. So here's their leader, um, who's gallant, he's noble, he's wonderful, he is, he's courageous, and his two sons are with him. You know, it's a family affair. And oddly, Savar, instead of talking more about the leader now, actually talks about the sons. They were beautiful boys, both of them. And so there's this emphasis on the children, emphasizing their youth, emphasizing that they're young, because they're boys, the two young sons. And what we have here, two, yes, the number two, but also two young, as in they are not old enough yet, T-O-O, -O, playing on that on that hominin, the two young sons. And it's this really nice undercutting of what's going on here because we know now, or we get this implication now that they're all gonna die. And therefore these beautiful boys, these young sons, they're too young, they're going to die as well. Savar regretted that he had never had the chance to sculpt either of them. So our impression that Savar was in some way an artist or involved in creation is borne out here. He is a sculptor. He is an artist. He, this explains why he's focused so much on the visual in this section. The prince he had done, of course, many times. The prince called him a friend. And so from this, we, we suddenly realize Savar, this character sitting on this bank, contemplating his death tomorrow in a battle, is a famous sculptor who's friends with the prince, who has sculpted the prince repeatedly. Therefore, he's probably a very famous sculptor, a very talented sculptor, a renowned artist. And he's on the front lines of a battle. So think about that. If you've put in your army on your front lines, you have your leader, you have his young sons, you have a, a sculptor. You've really scraped the bottom of the barrel to get bodies into armor. And that is unlikely then to be an invading army. It is far more likely to be a defensive army that has been scraped together very quickly to defend against an invader, which means if the other side are invading and they're to the north, we get the suggestion of the barbarians from the north, the Vikings raiding down into Europe. Oh my. But that's what's being suggested here, all extrapolation from the information that we've been given. The prince called him a friend. So not only is he a renowned artist, 
but he's also friends with the prince who is their leader. So they live in a sort of principality, one would assume. It could not be said, Savar thought, that he had lived a useless or an empty life. He'd had his art, the joy of it and the spur, and had lived to see it praised by the great ones of his province, indeed of the whole peninsula. So now this all has been brought full circle in that we have a, a river and the bank, two armies on either side, the invading armies to the north, the defending army, the desperate defending army is to uh, the south. Um, they're on a peninsula and he's from a province that's part of that peninsula. Everything has been set up here and we're given a lot of information. And we know that his greatest joy in life, the thing that he is renowned for, is his art. Um, art, the joy of it, the spur of it, it's the thing that gave him passion, and uh, gave him the joie de vivre, that this was at the heart of who he was. And it's a very external thing. This is what he is known for. This is why he is famous. This is, he's Savar, the sculptor. But the next thing he thinks about is, and he'd known love, as well. He thought of his wife and then of his own two children. So we've gone from, he's thinking about his life and he's going, oh, the, what have I done with my life? I'm a sculptor and I've done all of these things. But then he moves in and he's actually getting to the things that are even more important than the things that he's known for, the things he's most famous for. Because once he's dealt with that, he's like, no, but what's really important is this thing that I'm going to look at now at the end. And that's my family. And so even though it seems strange that the first thing he talks about is being a sculptor, the thing that he focuses on is actually his family. And he'd known love as well. He thought of his wife and then of his own two children, which is a nice point of connection to the discussion of the prince and the prince having two sons with him. The daughter whose eyes had taught him part of the meaning of life on the day she'd been born 15 years ago. So now we get a sense of, well, at least a rough age for Savar, because he has to be, you know, you would assume over 30 because he has a daughter who's 15. But also how important is his daughter to him that he, as a famous artist, as a famous sculptor, that on the day that she was born, he looked into her eyes and suddenly saw something new about the meaning of life. As a sculptor, as an artist, he's been striving for this. And it was in seeing his daughter's eyes the day that she's born that he realizes it. That's how important being a father is to him and why it's so much more important than being a sculptor. And his son, too young by a year to have been allowed to come north to war. So we know that his son uh, is young as well, but two young sons who were here with him, referring to the prince, too young by a year to have been allowed to come north to war. So although this is saying, yes, his son was not old enough to go to war, whereas the prince's sons were old enough to go to war, we're seeing that point of connection with too young, both the number and meaning also. Um, he'd embraced, oh, sorry, I skipped a bit. Um, Savar remembered the look on the boy's face when they had parted. He supposed that much the same expression had been in his own eyes. So again, this focus on eyes, on vision. And if we think that there is that old cliche that the, the eyes are the windows of the soul. And here is a sculptor who's all about the translating the vision into shape. These are all of, um, about visuals that he's, he's discussing. His vision of things. And that's why we seem to have this focus on eyes about seeing. He supposed that much the same expression had been in his own eyes. He'd embraced both children, then he'd held his wife for a long time in silence. All the words have been spoken many times through all the years. And that repetition of all the words, all the years, that repetition joins those two together. That we get a sense of the long history between Savar and his wife, the depth of emotion between Savar and his wife, that they don't need simple words 
to communicate what they feel because they have a lived experience. They know with every fiber of their being what they mean to one another. Words are now superfluous. Then he turned quickly so they would not see his tears. So we get a sense this is not <clears throat> Savar boldly going off to war. He's not proudly going off to war or courageously going off to war. He's going off to war. And even though we've had this discussion that they had this illusion that they could win, he is devastated leaving his family, being torn away from his family. He does not want to go. But he still goes, which speaks of duty, which speaks of loyalty, which speaks of you know, these sort of very positive characteristics. And mounted his horse, unwantedly awkward with a sword on his hip. And the, I absolutely love this because unwantedly is such an awkward word. And where we had earlier on the wavery, sinuous ripples to create that murmurous flow um, where every time Kay was referring to these things, it was this very soft language, this very gentle language. Here, when he is describing something that is awkward, unwantedly awkward, mounted his horse unwantedly awkward, it is a really cumbersome expression to say. And that is so deliberate because it gives you a sense, a feeling of the awkwardness of this sculptor trying to get on a horse with his with his sword and he's uh, he's not the dashing hero that this is almost embarrassing like how badly he gets on this horse and had ridden away with his prince to war against those who had come upon them from over the sea so yes they were on a um we got all of that sense earlier and it is being confirmed here they're on a peninsula so these people have come across from the sea that they've come from the north, that they are invaders, and that Savar and the prince and the people behind him are there to defend their families and their homes. So everything that we picked up in the subtext is now being confirmed. We'll finish just on this, this very last thing. He heard a light tread behind him and to his left from where the campfires were burning and voices were threading in song to the tune a Serenia played. He turned to the sound. And now we return to that wonderful stillness and quiet. That this night is so still and quiet that he can hear these distant voices, but also someone with a light tread walking through grass. He can hear that. That's how quiet and still this night is. And these voices threading in song. So again, these thin, delicate sounds. And then I don't know if this is a real musical instrument, but it's not one that I am familiar with, but Serenia, um, I'm guessing is a fantasy musical instrument. So again, highlighting that this is not our world. He turned to the sound. And is he turning to the sound of the tread? Is he turning to the sound of the voices threading in song and the music? Well, they're all in the same place and he's turning to the same place. So these things are being grouped together and that's what the next video is. We'll move on to discuss some of the sort of human elements. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I really like Guy Gabriel Kay has some beautiful lyrical uh, poetic prose and I'm really enjoying going through this and I hope you have too. So. All it remains to say is thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.